fans, it's the V.C. Andrews Critiquer. Always be sure to check the powdered sugar on donuts your mom gives you before you eat them. That's my new catchphrase. You can thank my dad for that. Anyway, today's review is going to be a real treat because we'll be looking at the most famous movie ever involving kids playing baseball. Well, okay, after that, obviously. A uh, little before that one, but that one is still a classic. Meh, close enough. This is Bad News Bears. It's the story of a Little League baseball team called, as you may have guessed based on the title, The Bears. And the reason they have Bad News as part of the movie's title is because they are bad news for any Little League coach hoping to be promoted to managing big leagues. The team is honestly so god-awful, they make Bucky McBadbat look like Babe Ruth by comparison. And the scapegoat, I mean, uh, lucky fellow, chosen to bring these misfits to glory is alcoholic, foul-mouthed former baseball player Morris Buttermaker. And it's kind of a match made in heaven. The kids are every bit as foul-mouthed and inconsiderate as he is. Seriously, sometimes these kids make the kids of South Park look like Gandhi by comparison. And both parties have very little, if any, dedication to winning the penance. Buttermaker drinks on the job to the point of passing out, exploits the kids for free labor at his normal profession when they're supposed to be practicing, and drinks on the job to the point of not passing out. Still wrong, though. And the Yankees coach, uh, that's the name of the best Little League team in their district, not the actual Yankees team, of course, won't stop rubbing his conceited ass in Buttermaker's face about it, but after an embarrassingly terrible first game, Buttermaker finds the kids aren't really bad players or even people. They're just... insecure for lack of a better word. So he starts emotionally connecting with them more, taking their practices more seriously, and even invites two new additions to the team, the spunky daughter of his ex-girlfriend and a juvenile delinquent, both of whom show they have exceptional talent for baseball. And slowly but surely, the Bears become better bit by bit, eventually making it to the pennant against the Yankees. But by now, Buttermaker's put winning above everything else, including his own team. So Buttermaker may very well win the game, but he just might lose the respect of his players. Though not quite on the levels of the Sandlot, Bad News Bears is indeed a sports movie comedy classic, and it should be, as it has everything perfect for that formula. A pathetic drunk as the baseball coach, a Little League team with Miles Fowler than Vladimir Putin's sense of honor, an aggressive rival coach almost as power mad as Putin, Okay, I'll stop with the propaganda for now. And a great lesson about the importance of having self-esteem, but not to the point where it turns into aggressive narcissism, because while that does get you a lot of trophies, it doesn't get you that many friends. But still, which version of this underdog story is better? The original beloved 1976 classic original, or its 2005 more mixed-reviewed remake from the School of Rock director Richard Linkarter? Let's hit a home run to find that out. This is Old vs. New, Bad News Bears. In real life, you gotta be very careful with who you assign to work with children. You've gotta only choose the most mentally stable and level-headed people out there. But in comedies, that would be super boring. So instead, they got Mr. Wilson from Dennis the Menace and Bad Santa, both of which lead to comedic possibilities as hilarious as they sound. This is Best Buttermaker. <laughs> Morris Buttermaker is the team coach, the alcoholic punk we find in two-thirds of comedies, and more or less the main character of the story. When we first meet him, it's very clear that this Little League coach job was an obligation and absolutely nothing more. But like the kids, we find he's not really a bad person, he just... well... Uh, he needed to do something good for society to reawaken the good side he had locked deep in that alcoholic, pathetic demeanor of his, and helping kids whose Little League team exists solely because of a threatened lawsuit seems to do just that. And both Walter Matthau and Billy Bob Thornton are pretty freaking hilarious as the character. You're not supposed to have open liquor in the car. It's against the law. So is murder, Engelberg. Now put that back before you get me into real trouble. All players must wear a comprehensive genital defense apparatus. And basically what that translates to is if any of you guys get hurt, 
then they're gonna sue my ass so hard they're gonna garnish my turds. So where are these things? But personally, I enjoy Walter Matthau's Buttermaker a bit more, mostly because he just seemed to have slightly better chemistry with the kids. Thornton got some nice moments bonding with the Tykes too, don't get me wrong, but Matthau's just felt a bit more endearing. Like, compare these scenes where he's trying to convince one of the players, a different character in each movie, which I'll go into more with the best supporting cast round, to not run away for fear of upsetting his family after getting completely owned in the first game, Thornton convinces him to lie his ass off to his pop and tell him what he wants to hear regarding the game. And yeah, it is pretty freaking hilarious to hear an adult tell a child this, and to imply that his pop is abusive, so maybe that wasn't such a bad suggestion. But Matthau's Buttermaker points out that his hero Hank Aaron's baseball career started almost as badly as their game today, and look where he got now by sticking to it and not giving up. Bit more heartfelt in my book. Or how about when he's trying to convince Amanda to play for the team? In both movies, he manages to win her over with reverse psychology, but in the original, they seal the deal by playing a game of catch together again just for old time's sake. Hell, even when he's supposed to come off as the uncaring asshole rope to coach in these lost causes, he still seems to have a bit of subtle care about them. Like when Matthau was doing roll call upon first meeting the Tykes in the original, he not only asks their names, but also what position on the team they'd like to play, while Thornton only asks for their names. And again, Thorn's moments of bonding with the kids were sweet too, some of which I'll talk more about in the side characters round, but not quite as much as Matthau's in my opinion. But at the same time, Matthau also seemed to better handle when Buttermaker becomes a self-righteous narcissist when they finally made it to the penance. Can't you get it through your thick head that I don't want your company? If I did, I would have looked you up two years ago. I wouldn't have waited two goddamn years. All season long, you've been laughed at, crapped on. Now you got a chance to spit it back in their faces, and what do you do? You're out there like a bunch of dead fish, not listening, bonehead plays, mistakes. I mean, don't you want to beat those bastards? Sad to say, I felt Thorne's take on these scenes were kind of underwhelming. I will give Thornton credit that his Buttermaker is slightly more developed than Matthau's, like, we learned that he was banned from baseball because he physically assaulted an umpire, apparently so badly that he needed 14 stitches to stop the bleeding. Go figure. Plus, for better or worse, this Buttermaker's a flat-out pervert. He sleeps with one of the players Toby's moms, who I'll discuss more a bit later, to celebrate the fact that his team doesn't suck anymore, and comes up with the most hilarious excuse when Tony asks him what he's doing at their house in the dead of night. And that's oil your mitt all the time. So I came by to check and make sure you oil your mitt. Yeah, that sounds plausible. Plus, he gets their uniforms made out of frickin' stripper club. With expected results. On the one hand, this adds a frickin' hilarious addition to Buttermaker's character that the original didn't have. On the other, though... I wasn't totally comfortable with this guy being around children. Again, both Matthau and Thornton were really damn funny as the character, and when you see how this guy redeems himself for how horrible he was to the kids in the scene I showed you a minute ago, you are going to be more than impressed. Trust me. But on the whole, I feel Matthau's take was a bit more emotional, both in the heartfelt sense when he was bonding with the kids, and in the sad sense when he was being the Donald Trump of baseball. So Matthau scores the first point of this match. Point goes to the old. And I got half a mind to find your old man and kick him in the nuts so hard he can never foul the earth with another little shit like you. No doubt you've heard the old saying, there are no bad students, only bad teachers. Well, that cliche does not apply to ball players and coaches, so cast all blame on the little shits for all I care. And maybe help them get better, but... Anyway, let's look at the most prominent of these little shits. I mean, uh, kids. But seriously, though, they are little shits at times, as you'll soon see. But they do still have a bit of charm. Okay, actually a lot, but... This is Best Main Kids! Kids who have the sense of humor of adults are often some of the most entertaining characters in all media, and Bad News Bears is no exception. Still, which group of kids is more entertaining, at least among the main ones in this round? I suppose we should start with Tanner Boyle, easily the most foul-mouthed kid on the team. Okay, I guess it's time to address the elephant in the room. The TV mature language that comes from this kid is funny as hell. You can take your apology out of your trophy and shove it straight up your ass! There's no I in team. Yeah? But there's an M and an E. 
This should be an F and a U. However, the political incorrectness that comes from him is not. Yeah, especially in the original, this kid is so racially, religiously, genderly, and sexual orientationally insensitive, he almost makes Cartman look like PC Principal. Even with it being severely toned down in the remake for obvious reasons, it's still fairly shocking. Bottom line, we're progressing a lot in society towards love and acceptance, and scenes from older movies like these make it pretty shocking that we used to live in a time like this. But again, most of his dirty jokes that aren't politically incorrect are pretty frickin' funny. And like Buttermaker, he does grow as a character throughout the film, even defending the booger-eating Lumpus. 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 Whatever, when he's being picked on by members of the Yankees team. And which one is better? Well, both Chris Barnes and Timmy Dieters do an awesome job of giving Eric Cartman a run for his money. And seriously, kudos to the casting directors of the remake for finding a kid who looks so much like the original, but I think I like Barnes' portrayal in the original a bit more. Why? Well, how do I describe this? Even though both actors were the same age of 10 when they played the character, Barnes just seemed a little more... uh... a little kiddish for lack of a better word. You know, that natural cutesy young kid vibe we see in so many other child actors like young Drew Barrymore or Dakota Fanning. So this made his extremely inappropriate language all the more shocking and hilarious. Timmy Dieters just didn't feel quite as plucky or endearing, so his foul language didn't have the same shock value. Don't get me wrong, it was still shocking as hell, but not quite as much as the more plucky Barnes. So, point to Chris Barnes. What about Mike Engelberg, the... <clears throat> big boned kid of the team? Anyway, he was definitely the hardest to decide among the main kids because both are very well portrayed. They're both very entertaining. Somebody's gonna pay for this windshield, and I think, Engelberg, it's gonna be your father. Bullshit. You better shut up before I tell some you touch my pecker! And both really know how to say, Yeah, cut the frickin' bullshit. I know you're implying I'm fat, asshole. Piss off. Again, this one was extremely close, but if you twisted my arm and forced me to choose, I think I'd give a slight edge to the original, played by Gary Lee Cavanaro. He just felt a little more assertive and tough, so it was more satisfying to watch him own people who subtly made fun of him being overweight. Like, compare these scenes. I have to eat all the time, keep my metabolism up, so my body becomes a fat-burning machine, so assholes like you don't give me shit all the time! There's chocolate all over this ball. Look, Mr. Buttermaker, quit bugging me about my food. People are always bugging me about it. My shrink says that's why I'm so fat, so you're not doing me any good, so let's quit it! See what I mean? Both can stand up for themselves, no doubt, but I think bullies would be a little more scared to call this kid fat than this one. Now on to Kelly League, the juvenile delinquent who often crashes the Little League games on his motorcycle, and I kinda mean that literally, but eventually becomes Amanda's boyfriend and the team catcher. Anyway, despite the trend the originals had so far, I actually prefer the one the remake played by Jeffrey Davis. He just had funnier lines and honestly just felt more like a juvenile delinquent than Jack Harold Davis did in the original, though I'm not gonna play any clips demonstrating this to keep the length of this round reasonable. Then there's my personal favorite of the main kids, Amanda Wurlitzer, the spunky daughter of Buttermaker's ex-girlfriend. She's probably the most developed of the kids, where she's... kind of a tomboy in denial. She wants to be a stereotypical girl, namely buy dresses, take ballet lessons, and all that jazz, but is also assertive, likes to roughhouse, and is honestly a better ball player than all the boys on the team combined. And while not as profane as Tanner, she's got some pretty risque, but still friggin' hilarious lines. I know an 11 year old girl who's already on the pill. Don't ever say that word again. Jesus, just who in the heck do you think you are? Your goddamn manager, that's who. Big Wow! Man, you must have a big one, because I don't know what else my mom saw in you. I'm not supposed to be talking about my, my one. You're 12 years old. As far as you know, I'm like G.I. Joe down there, okay? I have the internet, you know, I'm not stupid. And which one is better? This was also a close pick, but once again I prefer the original played by Tatum O'Neill. She just seemed a little more charismatic and, honestly, just funnier. Like, compare the job she's working when Buttermaker first invites her to the team. In the remake, she's just selling clothes overpriced at a retail store, but in the original, she has her own personal roadside business where she sells people maps to celebrities' homes dressed like a frickin' hooker, no less. How hilarious is that? And I also felt she had a stronger connection to Buttermaker. You can really feel her having fun when she and Buttermaker play catch again for the first time in years to seal a deal of her joining the team, a scene we sadly never got in the remake. And remember that scene 
I showed you earlier where Buttermaker was telling her to piss off and that he didn't care about her? That was just after she had invited him to go to a concert with her after the game to reconnect as would have been stepfather and stepdaughter. Amanda is indeed very hurt in both movies, but you can really feel the betrayal and disappointment a lot more from Tatum O'Neill. Okay, I do think I have to address the other elephants in the room. Ten years ago, Amanda's actress in the remake, Sandy Con Craft, was killed in a car accident when she was just 20. So, to family and friends of hers who might be watching this video, I just want to reiterate that Sandy did still do a good job as the character. I just personally enjoyed O'Neill's performance a little better. Hell, all the main kids are really good in both films. But since I like three out of four of them better in the original, old scores another point with this round. Point goes to the old. I left more town floating in a shitter this morning than all your retarded jerk-offs put together. <laughs> but of course, even the star players need the support of the other players to help them, as is the coach of the district to help get the team into shape. Sadly, there's not a whole lot of the second half of that in this movie, but there is a lot of the first, so let's look at Best Supporting Cast. <laughs> I guess it's fitting we start with the rest of the kids. They aren't quite as memorable as the four ones I've mentioned already. I hate to say this, really because they don't swear or use inappropriate behavior nearly as often, but let's get into it. Anyway, I guess we should start with Toby Whitewood, the son of the lawyer who sued to get the Bears team made in the first place who we'll talk about later. Personally, I prefer the one in the original, where he's the most helpful and responsible member of the team. Other than that funny scene I showed you earlier where Buttermaker has to BS about why he's at his house in the dead of night, the one in the remake really doesn't do that much. But on the whole, I think I like the side characters of the remake a little better, not just because they're given more to do, but the film honestly features a lot more diversity among them, which works great given that this team is meant to be the diverse Little League team that no one has any faith in only to be proven quite wrong. Not only is the ethnicity of some of them changed, like the baseball stat quoting nerd Rudy Steinberg, or Primal Harry as he's called here, but there are also some new minority characters created for the remake, like Yeradeka, uh, something, and a crippled kid named Matt Hooper. That's right! I'm in a wheelchair! I'm not saying that as an insult, Hooper. I'm praising you for encouraging the movie's theme of the importance of diversity. But, more diversity aside, are the side characters more memorable personality-wise? Yeah, a little bit. Prima Harry's got a lot funnier lines than Rudy Steinberg. These things take time, guys. So does heart disease. I think I just had puberty. And Lumpus. 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 Whatever. Anyway, he's also got several more comedic scenes, not to mention the charisma of former child actor Tyler Patrick Jones. Shit. Lumpus. What the hell are you grinning at? Scared the hell out of me. Don't be leaning on the door. The one in the original played by Quinn Smith is okay, but he really doesn't do that much. Hell, I think he's got like 10 lines in that movie at best. What about Imad Abdul Rahim? Eh, the only thing he really offered was that scene where Buttermaker was giving him that pep talk in the original, which again is taken by Garadeka in the remake, and that's really all that he offers to that movie. What about the Yankees team? Eh, they're mostly just your usual one-dimensional bullies in both movies, but the ones in the remake are a little more vicious towards the bears, like in the original where they only pour ketchup in Lumpus's. Lumpus. Lumpus. Sorry, I'm just not good with that name for some reason. Anyway, while they only pour ketchup into his hat and dump Tanner into a trash can when he tries to defend him, in the remake they lock Lumpus, ah, dang it, in a porta potty and shake it and throw Tanner over a metal fence. A bit more cruel in my book. That's really it for the kids, so what about the adults? The rival coach I'm going to give his own round, so let's talk about the Little League district manager. I'd say it's a tie. Both do a pretty good job at coming off as conceited upper-class assholes who find the Bears a disgrace to their Little League district. Then there's the attorney who sued the Little League district to create the Bears team in the first place. In the original, he's called Bob Whitewood, played by Ben Piazza. and the remake, the character is female and called Liz Whitewood, played by Marsha Gay Harden, who some of you may recognize as Sarah from Flubber. I prefer Liz Whitewood, not only because making the character female brings even more diversification to the story, but the character's also a little more developed. In the original, it was never really explained why Whitewood was willing to sue to get a custom-made teammate for his son, but the 
the remake establishes Liz as a competitive soccer mom who forces her son into a variety of other after-school activities and wants baseball to be on her son's ever-growing resume. How when Buttermaker first meets her, she comes off as a moralist determined to be a good role model for her son. You hear that, Toby? Drinking and driving don't mix. That's right, and stay away from crack, too. One hit of that stuff and you wake up in prison married to some guy named Big Blue? Uh, yes, crack is bad, too. But when the Bears are finally starting to improve, she then conveniently tells him that she's really into bad boys like old Butter Boy and invites him for a one-night stand. Coincidence? I think not! Again, the original White would never really had that obsession with winning that the remake did. Hell, around the middle, he pretty much says, Yeah, I was an idiot for getting these morons their own team. Let's just ban before I have to put a bag over my face like Bucky McBadbat. But Liz's motives are far better explained and won't hear of the Bears disbanding. But what's really shocking is, when Buttermaker's finally starting to let some of the lesser talented kids play, I'll go more into this a bit later, where Bob in the original objects to having Lupus play, Hey, I finally said it right this time. Liz objects to having her own son, Toby, play in the finale. You know, he's your son. Yes, and he wants to win just like everyone else. Really? How would you know what he wants? Okay, so I think we better wrap this round up. So yeah, it's not saying a whole lot, but the side characters of the remake do have a little more personality and motivations than in the original, and even better, a lot more diversity, which does convey the message of the movie better. So congrats, remake, you scored your first point. Point goes to the new. Oh, come on, don't give me that righteous bullshit. <laughs> Now, naturally, a touch of friendly competition never hurt anyone. Unless, of course, said competition involves an evil queen and a formerly nice brainwashed Disney princess competing for a kingdom. Whoops, almost went to major spoilers of a new good but not great Disney Plus original movie there. But yeah, competition between literally coaches can be almost as brutal as what I almost went to spoilers with a second ago. But it does make for a good, uh, kind of villain? Uh, this is Best Yankees Coach. <laughs> Roy Turner slash Ray Bullock is the Yankees coach, the abusive father, and the closest thing the story has to a flat-out villain. In the original, he's played by Vic Morrow, and the remake, he's played by Greg Kinnear. Don't ask me the reason for the name change. Anyway, this character is a perfect foil to Buttermaker. He's professional, has his shit together, and takes his job seriously from start to finish, but also has no chemistry whatsoever with the boys on his team, including his own son, and just wants that Little League pennant trophy all to himself. And unlike the other three rounds, this one was as one-sided as the Bears' first game. Well, okay, maybe not quite that one-sided. No, that was something else. Nonetheless, it's kind of like comparing the main villains of the Stepford Wives comparison. Roy Turner may have less screen time than Ray Bullock, but he's able to leave much more of an impact in the time he does have. Vic Morrow had this natural gruff intimidation to him that worked perfectly for an aggressive, super competitive soccer mom or in this case, Soccer Dad. All of his condescending lines just feel so cold-blooded from Vic Morrow's delivery, ranging from an abusive, narcissistic drill sergeant at best, and Vladimir Putin about to conquer Ukraine at worst. Because if you guys lose this game, each and every one of you, you're gonna have to live with it. Look, what I saw out there today made me sick, you know that? Your team has no right being on that field. Look at yourself, Butterworth. Look at that team. Come on, get back to your dugout! Maybe a team could use your help, but I doubt it! What a dickhole. My problem with Greg Kinnear's Ray Bullock was, he just didn't seem all that intimidating or even that mean-spirited. Hell, compare how he's introduced in both movies. In the original, we see him yelling at Buttermaker to have Toby get his bike off their precious baseball field at once and then bitching about how Whitewood had to sue a Little League district as skilled as theirs to have a team made for his son and all the other rejects. In the remake, we first meet him attempting to actually socialize with Buttermaker and, and try to establish a healthy competitor relationship with him. Anyway, I think we're gonna have a lot of fun, learn a lot from each other, you know? And even the lines he does have where he's supposed to be the cold-blooded, abusive manager and father just don't have the same impact as the original. Morris, this isn't gonna work. I mean, they don't know the fundamentals of the game out here. This to save them the humiliation. You're gonna go through the world seeing yourself as a winner? Or a loser? I'm not 100% sure what the problem is. Maybe Greg Kinnear is just too naturally nice to pull the part off, or maybe director Richard Linklater had to give a more toned-down performance to be less shocking for modern audiences. But either way, it definitely leaves something to be desired. 
I think the best example of this is when he hits his own son for intentionally trying to smack Engelberg in the head with a ball, a scene that ultimately causes Buttermaker to realize just how awful he's been treating his own players, and motivates him to bring the bench warmers in. Let's look at the remake first. I tried to hit him! Did you try to hit him? No, it just got away from me. That's bullshit, Joey! Don't you ever throw it a batter? You never ever throw it a batter, you understand me? You never do that! Never do that. Uh, that wasn't a slap. He just accidentally knocked him to the ground by shaking him a bit too hard. Now let's look at this scene in the original. You tried to hit him, didn't you? No, it just got away. Come on, me! Try to hit him. This means no TV for a week. Well, okay, that doesn't actually happen, but come on, you would have much rather seen this asshole get grounded from TV privileges for a week than Arthur when he smacked DW for wrecking his plane. Oh well, seeing his own son intentionally lose to Engelberg and then walk out of the game is still pretty awesome. Anyway, I can't act like Greg Kinnear put no effort into this role, but be it miscasting or misdirection, he just didn't leave anywhere near as much of an impact as Vic Morrow did as the character. It's roles like these that make me so pissed with John Landis for getting said actor killed with that failed stunt in the Twilight Zone movie. We lost a great actor way too soon. But that's another story. Point goes to the old. Listen to you cry, baby! Once again, it's, uh, already won, I guess. Yeah, three to one score. Uh, but anyway, the remake won't forfeit for fear of looking like the Bears on their first game, so let's take a look at Best Story. <laughs> The finale is going to be a bit shorter because, honestly, the stories are already so damn similar to one another. Sure, there are a few small differences, like in the original, Buttermaker's a pool cleaner while in the remake he's a rat exterminator, and there are a few new scenes that the remake offers, most notably involving the supporting cast, but the stories are otherwise almost identical to one another. Not the levels of pointless shitty Disney remakes, thankfully, but still pretty similar. Another thing that makes it hard to determine the better film is, they're both just so timeless. Well, okay, not with the incredibly offensive and outdated slurs both movies have, but aside from that and a few pop culture references and internet usage here and there, the plots of both movies could honestly take place at any time period whatsoever. So does that mean it's a tie with the story, seeing how similar they both are? Well, not quite. Having great content itself is awesome, but execution is just as important. And honestly, the incredible acting and charisma of the cast of the original helps make the story's moments all the more powerful. Like Buttermaker being an asshole to Amanda and his team, Amanda's heartbreak over Buttermaker's initial rejection of her, Roy Turner hitting his own son, etc, etc. And like I've said before, the remake overall does do a pretty good job with these scenes as well. Well, again, except for the rival Yankees coach, and I really think that it helps that they got the director of the School of Rock to do this film, since both movies do have many similarities to one another. But again, the original was just... such a tough act to follow. These performances are on the level of Stranger Things, Breaking Bad, or pretty much everything Pixar. So naturally, even though I could feel a lot of effort from the cast of the remake, their competition was just in a league of their own. No pun intended. Again, I'm sorry I'm not really going into detail with this, but I kind of already have with the scenes I mentioned in the character rounds. And again, there are a few things about the remake story I like better. Like, I think it's funnier that Buttermaker's a rat exterminator in this version, especially seeing how he later has the boys help him with this kind of work for a bit early in the movie. Hell, he even gets a pretty hilarious scene in the intro where he succeeds in getting the rats out of a lady's basement, but then says she'll need a follow-up appointment to get them out of her kitchen now. And again, the side characters are done so much better in the remake, with more diversity and also more personality and motivations, but there's only so much that side characters can offer to your story. I guess the last thing I haven't mentioned yet is the ending. So, as you know, Buttermaker lets the lesser skilled players have a shot once he realizes how he's been acting, and despite expectations, the lesser skilled players actually perform pretty impressively, and the score gets tied. But unfortunately, they just barely lose by just barely getting called out before making a home run. But that's okay, because they did win something even better than a penance cup. 
respect, not just for themselves or each other, but also from the Yankees, who have to admit that they really did perform impressively out there and sincerely apologize for being bad sports, because ultimately, an empty trophy is not nearly as awesome as self-respect or just having fun playing ball. And of course, the Bears accept their apology gracefully and- You can take your apology out of your trophy and show them right up your asses. Nice. Yeah, like hell they would. As funny as it was to hear the nerdy Primo Harry deliver this line in the remake, nothing can top the original Tanner Boyle's delivery of it. Plus, having it topped off with Lupus standing up for himself is just awesome. And like most of the other comparisons here, the passion they have while celebrating their second place victory with non-alcoholic beer is pretty freaking awesome. But just look at it in the original. These definitely look more like kids who finally earned admiration for the first time in their lives. And that's really all I got. So to reiterate, the remake is a pretty good movie as is and has my full recommendation, but it just had too big of a baseball cap to fill in comparison to the original, which is just, again, in a league of its own, and ultimately, the better movie. And thus, Old scores the victory point of this exciting match. Sorry for the lack of a concession stand during the game, though. Can't afford it. See you next year, bitches! <laughs> Ooh!